What is up, health enthusiasts? It's Coach Lambie here for Working Weights LLC, your guide to strength, health, and all things nutrition. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Dwayne Ulrich, a.k.a. Poppy Dwarl. Hey, guys. Today, we are going to talk about how to lower your blood sugar. Guys, all you right. all, you missed it. You just missed it. We we just recorded about two or three minutes of the most exciting, fun podcast stuff, and we we didn't hit. Except the record. we didn't record. We didn't hit the record <laughs> button. <laughs> we talked about Coach Lambie's soothing voice, and uh, it mm. just it just. Yeah, so uh, listener feedback is that I have a soothing voice and I should read books to put people to sleep professionally. So (laughs) that was like, wait a minute, is that a good thing? What what does that mean? (laughs) My apologies to everyone out there. Uh, Hilarious. All right. Uh, Yeah, let me share the screen. We'll get into today's podcast and uh, see if we can make this. A short one. At some point, you're going to have to like make that a little bit larger for me because mm-hmm. kind of right now it looks one of the, one of the ships from Star Wars. Ooh, an Imperial destroyer. Yes, like an Imperial <laughs> destroyer, man. <laughs> yeah. Dun, 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 dun. All right, talking awesome. about how to reduce your blood sugar, and this is uh, episode two in our December series on. I'm not really sure what to call this. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, your dietary guide improvement, better, your guide to better health in all things nutrition. Got yeah, guide to better health in all things nutrition. All right, how to reduce your blood sugar. Uh, so before we get into this, <clears throat> I want to preface this with everybody if you have not heard it or seen it, which all of these podcasts are on YouTube, and I highly recommend that you go to YouTube and um, watch the podcast because you get to see everything that we're putting on the screen here rather than just listening to it. Right. But if you have not listened to or watched the episode on uh, blood glucose and whether or not lowering it is better, I highly recommend that you do that. So I want to preface this podcast with if you have, if you currently have an HbA1c of 5.5 or less or a fasting blood glucose of uh, 90 or less, there doesn't seem to be Uh, a large body of evidence or very strong evidence that actively working to lower it further than that will provide you any significant health benefits in the long run. Okay. So this is going to be probably more geared towards people who are above that 5.5 HbA1c. Most people are probably not taking their fasting glucose numbers in the morning, uh, but you've probably been advised by your doctor to control your sugar intake There goes my camera. It's all right. Yeah. You've probably been advised um, by your doctor and um, uh, you're probably borderline pre-diabetic, pre-diabetic or borderline diabetic. And so this is going to be kind of aimed for you. And then for everybody else, this is some, um, you know, just some good information for you to keep in your back pocket. So starting up here at the top, the biggest driver in reducing blood glucose is going to be weight loss. Okay. And this speaks to uh, a personal fat threshold. There's a lot of information online about carbs and blood sugar. uh, And we're going to talk about some of that today, but doing the um, uh, outlining this whole thing for this podcast today really gave me a indication that we probably need to do a couple other podcasts on some of these topics here, but weight loss is the biggest driver of reducing blood glucose. So, if, so you have some extra weight to lose. The One of the biggest things that you can do to drive down that blood glucose is going to be losing weight. Uh, any diet or exercise program that induces weight loss will improve glycemic control. And the best results come from combining the two. Uh, and what I forgot to mention in here is the weight loss drugs now. So Ozempic and Wigovi. So Ozempic this is just a tangent, but Ozempic is the uh, drug to treat diabetes and Wigovi is the drug for weight loss. So just everybody knows that's just a little snippet there. All right. So we're going to talk about our diet because this is probably uh, the biggest thing that people are going to look at or associate with lowering their blood glucose. Scroll all the way back up to the top. And the most common question that I get 
is do I have to go low carb? So this is probably one of the biggest health issues that I coach people on today. I don't do a whole bunch of um, of just getting jacked in tan anymore. So, but this is a, a the biggest question I get: Do I have to go low carb? So, uh, from from the American Diabetes Association, and a lot of information that I that I have is from the American Diabetes Association in their um, Lifestyle Management and Standards of Care in Diabetes Edition 2019. So that's a journal. There, this is a quote, there is not a one size fits all eating pattern for individuals with diabetes and meal planning should be individualized. Okay. So to answer the question, do I have to go low carb? The answer is no, you don't. Okay. Uh, it does seem to work very, very well for some people and it does not for others, but it, it, this is one of those things where you are going to have to individualize this, um, to suit your needs. Uh, because as we'll go through a lot of this stuff here today, people don't tend to adhere to new diets very well. Mm-hmm. You often true. tend reverting back to your old ones. So what we what we work a lot with is substitutions. Uh, so studies examining the ideal amount of carbohydrate intake for people with diabetes are inconclusive. Okay, so the the advice we're getting online on YouTube, social media and stuff <clears throat> is that you have to keep your carbohydrates at some specific amount. The The information on that is not does not support that recommendation. All right. Uh, for people with type 2 diabetes or prediabetes, low carbohydrate eating plans show potential to improve glycemia and lipid outcomes for up to one year. Now, this is the big caveat here. There is not a whole bunch of long-term data on low-carb diets specifically addressing diabetes, prediabetes, or glycemic control. Uh, and what what is available for long-term does not look good, okay? Uh, we're not going to go too much in-depth today. That will be something for a, another podcast uh, but I just want to let you guys know that, and then you know, in another podcast, I'll I'll explain in detail why I feel that way. But part of the challenge in in, in interpreting low carbohydrate carbohydrate research is due to the wide range of definitions for a low carbohydrate eating plan. And this is something that you'll hear in the low carbohydrate groups is anytime a research paper comes out and says a low carbohydrate diet versus a high carbohydrate diet. And then the low carb crowd always goes, well, that wasn't low carb enough. I've heard that. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. So it's, there's, there's just kind of seems to be this really wide range of, of who considers what to be low carb in it. And so it's really challenging to, um, to put together a good consensus statement on it. All right. And then down here, we're not going to get too much into this stuff, but I have included um, some of the more popular uh, research that people in the low carb communities will often point to, to suggest that uh, their, you know, low carb methods are um, kind of the best at, at controlling glucose. And so, but we have the Verta Health and then also Jason Fung, who's a very popular um, social media guy. He's written books. He's a, oh, I forget what the word is. Uh, but anyway, he, he, he's, a, he's a, a doctor. He works with, a, I want to say the kidneys. He's a kidney specialist. Phrenology? <clears throat> yes. He's a phrenologist. Phrenologist. He's in Canada. Uh, and he helps people um, lose weight, get off diabetes medication, and he does uh, um, fasting. So his big his big claim to fame is fasting, but he also uses a low carb diet in conjunction with that. Uh, and so one of the um, one of the big uh, benefits to these low carb diets is people often reduce the reduce or eliminate the amount of medication. So diabetic medication that they uh, normally would have to have when they do the, and so, you know, that's a positive. So I don't see a whole bunch of, of benefits long-term to the glycemic control. And we can see like from the Verta Health here, the HbA1c line. So Verta Health, they did uh, their trial, which is, it's a non-randomized control trial. Um, so basically everyone volunteered to be in this uh, low carb thing. So they had a low carb um, eating plan, dietary lifestyle management to control diabetes versus a kind of standard of care diet. Um, and they were supposed to report five years worth of data. Now, as the years went along, the amount of data that they put out became less and less and less. 
So uh, three and a half years, they have almost not a lot of data. Um, oh, I guess I didn't put the link in here. I'll put the links in for the show notes. You guys can go in and see it. So, But for HbA1c, at baseline, everybody came in. The average was 7.6. At one year, it was 6.2. Now, that's a fantastic drop. That is huge. Yeah. That's massive. However, at two years, 6.6. So still pretty good. But then at three and a half years, the average Natural was seven. seven. Okay. So as we can see here is that after one year, HbA1c, so your your three-month blood glucose levels started to return to baseline. Now, I the five-year data is impossible to find. I know that they did a presentation to the American Diabetes Association, and they really only reported on the people who had good success, which there was like 275 people who started the trial. And at five years, it ended up being like 11 people had had um, uh, good control of their of their diabetes. So, uh, you know, and for the one and two years, they have tons and tons of data. I mean, they have all kinds of measurements, everything that you would ask for. At three and a half years, there's almost no data being reported other than these few things that I have listed here. And then at five years, like I say, it's non-existent. You can't find it. Uh, so, but the HbA1c is going up. Now, we might say that, okay, well, people probably aren't adhering to the diet. However, when we look at fasting insulin, at baseline, it's 286 at one year, it's 18. At two years, it's 17.5. Three and a half years, they didn't report fasting insulin. So, But the one and two year numbers are the same and two years is lower. And that indicates to us, this fasting insulin number, is that they are adhering to this ketogenic diet. So right. they are adhering to it, but the HbA1c is going up, which tells me I'm not a doctor, but these people are becoming more insulin resistant, not yeah. less, because they're eating... They're eating such a low amount of carbohydrate that they're in a state of nutritional ketosis. Yeah. But their HbA1c is going up. Not too much more on that. I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time on that right now. All right. So what are some good recommendations here? <clears throat> so what I like to try to, to advise people is to keep your carbohydrates lower than about 45% of total energy. Most American diets are about 55 to 60% carbohydrate. So a drop in 10 to 15% of total of total carbohydrates doesn't seem to be a huge deal for most people, especially when we start making substitutions. Now, what kind of carbohydrates are we looking at? So we want to look at whole grains, beans, nuts, legumes, berries, and non-starchy vegetables. So these would be green vegetables, red, yellow, um, all of your peppers and and green leafy vegetables and stuff like that. We want to limit but not exclude starchy veggies and fruits. And then we do want to avoid sugar sweetened beverages, including fruit juice and refined grains and sugars. Oh man. <laughs> fruit juice, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. It is better to eat the whole fruit. Uh now the um smoothies actually I'll have to link it in here, but smooth. If you take your fruits and you make a smoothie, it actually has a slower uh, release into your bloodstream. So the the amount of carbohydrate absorbed is actually slower. It's weird. There's not a whole bunch of research on that, but there is a little bit. Uh, so smoothies are actually would be a kind of okay thing. All right, now your fats. Fats I tend generally tend to recommend keeping greater than thirty five percent of total energy. And now the amount of fat is less important than the type. Are you talking about total fat? The amount of total fat is less yes. important? Really? The amount of total fat is less important than the type. So we want to limit our intake of saturated fats. And the reason behind that, there's a, a, few, a few reasons, but I just put one in here. Okay. Saturated fat increases liver fat, also known as NAFLD, intrahepatic triglycerides, or hepatic steatosis more than unsaturated fat or simple sugars. And I've linked a few and I have a plethora, brother. I have a plethora a of plethora, research. Plethora. A yes. plethora of research. Okay. So here's a few showing the difference between uh, feeding saturated fat and unsaturated fats and uh, fructose and glucose and simple carbs and all that other stuff. 
Uh, so there's a few here if you're so inclined to check that out. But saturated fat increases liver fat more than other types of fats or sugars. And that is important because part of insulin resistance, specific, you know, really, really the one that we want to be concerned with is insulin resistance in the liver. Once the liver becomes fill, fold up, it starts to spill over into the pancreas. Yeah. And then we have beta cell func uh, dysfunction. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. this is waterfall cascade. Once your liver starts to become insulin resistant, then it starts to dump sugar glycogen. It starts to dump its glycogen stores. All right, because it's not receiving the signals that insulin is in the system and please stop producing glycogen. Please stop, you know, adding sugar to the system. Yeah. And then once that gets fold over, the spill the fat spills over into the pancreas, starts affecting beta cell function. So now you have high sugar and low insulin production. Beta cells are the cells that produce insulin. It's a cascade. Yes. We want to have a high intake of polyunsaturated fat. Uh, now, most people, what I can say is polyunsaturated fat that everyone is going to understand is going to be omega-3s. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we want a high intake of omega-3s. And so things we can look at that are high in polyunsaturated fat is vegetable oil or soybean, soybean oil. Grapeseed oil is actually like super high in polyunsaturated fat. Non-hydrogenated margarines, which means you'll have to look at the ingredient list and it'll say soybean oil, corbin, corn oil, uh, soybean, canola oil, or something like that. Then you want to make sure it doesn't say hydrogenated. Uh, I can't believe it's not butter light is a good um, margarine to use. That's what I use. Fatty fish, soy-based products like tofu and edamame, flax seeds and oil and walnuts. And then we want to have a moderate to high intake of monounsaturated fats. And these would be things like olive oil, avocado oil, canola oil, sesame oil, and most nuts seeds. Uh, and I put pumpkin in here, but it's supposed to be pumpkin seeds. Most nuts and seeds are going to be monounsaturated fats. All right, protein. We want to keep our protein about 15 to 30% of total energy. Now, interestingly enough, is when they do controlled feedings, um, not, not exactly controlled feedings, but when they do controlled experiments and they're allowing people to eat ad libitum, which means freely as much as they want, people will generally tend to eat until they reach a, um, a protein threshold of about 15 to 18%. You mean per meal? Either per meal or total for the day. Really? Yeah. So there's kind of like, there seems to be this, uh, this switch in our, in our bodies, uh, to to turn on satiety to turn off the hunger signals once protein reaches about that 15 to 18 percent all right now current research on protein intake doesn't support adjusting protein intake to improve health span the research is inconclusive on optimizing glycemic control or cardiovascular disease basically what that means is there is no evidence to keep protein moderate to low because insulin Okay, so protein, so amino acids actually have an insulinogenic effect, meaning they stimulate insulin production. Insulin helps amino acids get into the cells. All right, so carbohydrates mm -hmm. will stimulate um, insulin production, but also will amino acids. And uh, one of the recommendations that comes in the low carb communities is to keep your protein intake low because insulin, their belief is that uh, any, like any amount of insulin is bad for you. So you want to keep it as low as possible. No, it's not now, true. Yeah. Uh, there is some research showing that supplementing whey protein before meals reduces the postprandial glucose. So the glucose spike, quote unquote, spike after eating. And it reduces that incremental area under the curve. So if we go back to that sugar episode or the uh, uh, blood glucose episode, and we talked about the area under the curve. So having protein, um, I believe it was about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes before sitting down and having a meal helps in reducing that blood glucose excursion. So the total area under the curve for the day would be smaller. Uh, and there is some research supporting higher intakes. So or 25 to 30% to increase satiety. And that helps with blood glucose control for pre-diabetics and diabetics. Okay. So having a, a really, really high protein intake generally stimulates um, that satiety mechanism a little bit more than say 15 to 18% would. So people end up eating less on average, which 
allows them to lose weight and it allows them so you're 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 just taking in less carbohydrate over the day because you're eating less right so what do we want to, what do we want to focus on for our, our protein we want to focus on protein from plant sources plant sources and we want to limit our intake from red meat okay and that's specifically because red meat does have that saturated fat in it now somebody might say well just choose um you know low fat lean meat so that's you know probably fine uh, to have that a few times a week. Uh, but we do have evidence that the heme iron actually acts independently on insulin resistance in the liver and pancreas. Okay. Yes. All right. Now, what are some dietary patterns? So if you wanted to go online and look up, you know, what are, how could you change your diet to help improve glucose control? So we have long-term evidence for vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, and Mediterranean diets. And so I think by now we should probably be starting to see some carryover from our cholesterol lowering podcast to this one, right? Um, now for short-term evidence, we do have short-term evidence that keto works low carb, just the general low carb, but not ketogenic, intermittent fasting, time-restricted eating, and a low glycemic index. So there's short-term evidence on that. So again, like under one year, uh, keto does produce some pretty fantastic results. Not going to lie. Okay. So does the fasting. They have pretty excellent results one year. After that, stuff doesn't, uh, there really doesn't seem to be a superiority from those to any other diet. Um, and the Mediterranean diet seems to have the best evidence, but I think it's just because of the amount of evidence that there is. The amount of evidence on the Mediterranean diet is just massively large. And so that's probably just why it it, it shows to be better over to, overall. Probably in the long run, there's gonna, not going to be a whole bunch of difference between them. Let me throw something out there and, and, as a question sure. to you. So what we were looking at a little while ago, just from the uh, uh, from the study, and I get it that the um, the five year was very very minimal reporting, but like on the short term keto uh, diets, low carb diets, um, as far as their impact on uh, lowering uh, your blood glucose, so. It seems like that it, that would suggest, and of course, this is just a, a, a generality, but it seems like that kind of indicates that there is a, a curve back up, you know, mm -hmm. from, from the lowering and then just over time. In other words, what I'm trying to say is like, uh, even though we only have short term evidence, like a keto diet or a low carb diet, while it's all oh, that's great when it starts, but then it's like, you know, we were talking about how the body is like coming back up in the curve. Um, I don't remember the term you used, but, uh, it would suggest that a long-term keto diet, a long-term low carb diet is not yeah. sustainable as far as keeping your, your numbers down. Is that, is, is that a good conclusion? Yeah. So the, um, <clears throat> the evidence on adherence to ketogenic diets and low, and low carbohydrate diets seems to be that they, they're kind of hard to adhere to long-term. Right. Um, now, in this trial, the Verta Health trial, yeah, yeah, um, based on the other numbers, so like their weight, right, and the fasting insulin, uh, that generally tends to tell it. So they were also receiving um, basically coaching, nutritional coaching through this process, and so that right. kind of tells us that they were adhering in the Verta Health trial. Now, the reason for the HbA1c is that when you go on a low carbohydrate diet or a ketogenic diet you actually develop a physiological insulin resistance in your muscle tissue. And the reason for that is that you're not consuming enough glucose to feed everything. So your body is going to turn insulin resistance on in certain tissues so that it can spare it for the ones that need it the most. So like your brain, your central nervous system, those things exclusively run on glucose so right. it, it's going to be very, very important for that. Now, that is not a pathological form of insulin resistance in the way diabetes is. So okay. the physiological response versus a pathological response. But I'm not really sure how anyone can make the case that being in a physiological state of insulin resistance is beneficial. Right. And I think that the evidence shows that that's the case, right? Is right. that you, you are 
you are in a state of insulin resistance in the HbA1c and the fasting glucose shows that. Right, right. So in my in, in my understanding then basically a keto diet, low carb diet, that's not really intended to be long term. Whereas if someone's working with a Mediterranean diet, vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, mm. those are sustainable. Those it can be a sustainable not just a diet, but a lifestyle, a nutritional lifestyle. Yeah. So, so dietary pattern is what we want to focus on. Right. Is something is something. So, a dietary pattern is just the way you eat every day. It's not a diet that you're on. Right. Right. And when we say something like the the Mediterranean diet or the Nordic diet, these are just um, patterns, kind of frameworks yeah. by which to hang your diet. So, the majority of your diet is made up by plant materials. And then, you know, you have um, uh, moderate intakes of fish and chicken and stuff like that. Right. And limited amounts of, of red meat, sugars, other things like that. So it's just right. a framework. Right. Um, now, the ketogenic diet, it, obviously, it does work very, very well for some people, right? Yeah. And it doesn't Short seem term. to be – well, even long term, I think there are people, there are some people who find great success with it. But it's not everyone. So I think that the calls – you know, that, that, um, everyone should be switching over to that type of diet. I don't think are founded in, in evidence. Um, but so if I was to, if somebody really, really wanted to do a ketogenic diet to lose weight and improve their blood glucose, I would use it, um, you know, in place of a, uh, a fat loss phase. So you would periodize your, mm -hmm. your, nutrition throughout the year, which is what I coach most people to do anyways. So everyone wants to lose fat and I have to tell everyone fat loss is a phase. Right. It's not a lifestyle. Right. You should not always be trying to lose fat. Okay. That's very stressful on the body. Um, and you get to a certain point and your body is going to start fighting back on you. So if you were to, if you, if you've done a ketogenic diet before and you've had found great success with it, then I think that it's a viable option to use short term, right? So three to six months, we can use that ketogenic diet, get some fat off of you, improve a whole bunch of numbers, right? The the evidence clearly shows it's very, very good at doing that. Right. But then we have to come out of that phase and we would go into maintenance at some point, which is where we would start reintroducing carbohydrates. Right. So a lot of people get focused on the blood sugar part of this. Right. But micro focused sugar, on that. Yeah, yeah. The blood sugar is just the symptom. It isn't the cause of this stuff. Right. And that, that seems to be our understanding of this stuff is, is light years ahead of where it was like even 10 years ago. And we now know it has a lot more to do with personal fat threshold. And it's more about consuming more energy than you right. are expending. Right. Right. Right, right. So right. utilizing those strategies to get the weight off, I don't think is a bad idea. But at some point you have to you have to come out of that phase, reintroduce carbohydrates because we want the machinery in your body that processes carbohydrates to come back online. We want that physiological insulin resistance response to go away. Because so one of the main claims to uh, um, these diets is that they quote unquote reverse diabetes. Well, they don't reverse diabetes because even if you were to get your blood glucose down and your weight came down and you come off insulin and all these other things, how do we know that um, uh, you've actually reversed diabetes? Well, we would challenge you with an oral glucose tolerance test and people who are on ketogenic low carbohydrate diets will fail an oral glucose tolerance test Wow! because they are physiolog physiologically insulin resistant. Wow. Okay. Wow. So I don't think it's a bad strategy short term. Right. Right. Long term, I don't think the evidence is there to support it. And the ketogenic diet wasn't even uh, um, introduced as a weight loss or a diabetes diet. It was designed originally to treat epilepsy that was resistant to medical treatment. Wow. Epilepsy in children specifically. Wow. And just, if you look, if you look at the at the uh, research on ketogenic diets and children with epilepsy, the health outcomes are atrocious. Wow, that's amazing. It just seems to me that that sometimes in and then people people interchange the word diet with 
like just their nutritional intake. Yeah. They use that term loosely. So, oh, I'm on the keto diet. Well, wait a minute. Or even when I was talking about the Mediterranean, you said that that's a framework. Mm -hmm. And and I can understand that. So if I talk about the Mediterranean diet, I'm not talking about like, oh, we're doing Mediterranean because I need to drop pounds or whatever. But I, I believe in my mind, I feel like that a lot of times people will focus on, oh, I'm going to cut all my carbs because that I'll drop weight. Mm -hmm. Well, they've been told that they don't really know what all is going to happen when you focus on just dropping carbs, that, that, that the nutrition picture is, a, is much larger than just focusing on dropping carbs or just this or just that. And, and I know yeah. we're talking about lowering your blood sugar today, <laughs> but yeah. I, mean, I just like, you know, if, if people get hyper-focused on one thing, then, uh, you know, everything else kind of gets out of whack and it's, well, it's a system it's a system. Did that make yeah. sense? So yeah, the the word diet has become um, hijacked to mean something. Then you're on that you're on. You either go on a diet, you come off a diet, rather than the um, you know original from term for the word. So it comes from the Greek, I believe it's dieta, which means like your habitual daily habits. Yeah, don't even get it, me started. It doesn't mean something that you're on and off. Don't even get me started on on fat burner pills. Don't even want to get me started on that. Fat burner pills. <laughs> okay, I'm burning that back. We'll have a podcast melt, on that. All right, it, getting back to this. <laughs> so we have something called chrono nutrition. All right, and so there ha there is some research uh, showing that eating earlier in the day and eating the majority of your carbohydrates earlier in the day improves glycemic control. So there's something called a uh, second meal phenomenon. So people who skip breakfast and they've, they've done uh, control trials on this. So I'll have people skip breakfast and then eat lunch and dinner, or they'll have people eat breakfast and then lunch. And what they find is that the people who eat breakfast and then lunch tend to have a lower area under the curve for the day rather than the people who eat lunch and then dinner and the glycemic response to the lunch. And it's the same lunch in both groups, but the glycemic response in the breakfast crowd to the lunch is, is much, much lower. So you'll have kind of this, um, a bigger response for breakfast, but then at lunch, that response is much lower uh, versus if you skip breakfast, that response is high for lunch and dinner. All right, and then consuming foods in a particular order. So there's some uh, uh, advice out there that you should eat your vegetables first and then your protein and then your carbs like your rice or um, potatoes or starches, whatever, last. Uh, now, the evidence on that is limited and weak, um, and I don't think that you're going to find that makes a whole bunch of difference. And then some other things like supplements like apple cider vinegar, uh, it, it does lower blood sugar, but we're talking about like 0.2%. So if you have mm. a HbA1c of 7.6 and it goes to 7.4, yeah. you're not curing your diabetes with, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. With yeah. apple cider vinegar. Yeah. Okay. Plus it's nasty in your mouth. Yeah. All right. Now for our exercise, walking after meals improve improves glucose control both postprandially and 24 hour responses now the best research that we have is for 20 minute walks uh and then there's also some good research on kind of like a hit style so interval style kind of walking where you kind of walk real hard for for uh, 30 seconds to a minute and then you slow down and then you walk real hard for 30 seconds to a minute and you do that for like five to ten minutes Yep, there seems yep. to be pretty good um, evidence on that. However, if you just get up after you eat and you go for a walk, your glycemic response, so that glucose excursion after you eat will be lower um, uh, because as we move our bodies and we make our muscles work, there is a response to uptake glucose without insulin. So... A lot of the way we get glucose into the cells is through insulin. So insulin unlocks the door, so to speak, for glucose to come in. But right. when we exercise, that opens the door without needing a key. Very All cool. right. Very and cool. for our other types of training here, so there is a, uh, improvement in either aerobic training 
or resistance training, but the biggest improvement is when both are combined. So you're doing two to three um, sessions of resistance training per week and two to three session, sessions of aerobic training per week. All right, so overall, the best way to lower your blood glucose is to lose weight by improving the quality of your diet, focusing mostly on plant proteins, consuming unsaturated fats, and combining resistance training with aerobic training. Man, that's good right. information. That's that's awesome. I just, uh, that's good. That's just good. Yeah. So let's talk about some practical things. So this still might be a little bit daunting for people. Um, and I didn't want to make a whole bunch of recommendations in our um, cholesterol episode. Right. Uh, and so now we can combine the two. So when we look at substitutions, Again, there, there's not good evidence that completely changing your diet is going to uh, help you long term because most people just go back to the way that they were eating before. It's really, really hard to adhere to something new. So you want to make small changes gradually, like I, I would say one or two changes a week, mm -hmm. okay, to move towards some kind of a dietary, like a Mediterranean diet um, and getting away from where you are now. So right. we're looking at substitutions. Don't try to change the the types of foods that you're eating, but rather substitute the ingredients. So if we think about something like a sandwich, so a lot of my recommendations I have, um, I call, uh, what is it? PP triple S. So pizzas, pastas, sandwiches, soups, and salads. Okay. And people tend to generally, uh, you know, enjoy those, those types of foods. So if we think about a pizza, most people are just going to buy a frozen pizza or you're going to order it, all right? So let's start thinking about substitutions that we could make on this pizza. So when we think about the crust, the crust is usually going to be refined, processed, um, enriched white flour. flour so we yeah. can swap that for a whole grain crust, so a whole wheat crust. You can swap that for a cauliflower crust. Uh, I've even made and I have seen recipes online where you can make a, a crust out of chicken which what? was actually really good. Or there was oh one my that was gosh. made out of cheese. That was really good too. What kind of cheese? Uh, I think it was mozzarella, ricotta. There was a couple of them in there. So okay, I'm about really, that. It was really good. It was yeah, really, the, really the, good. The chicken crust kind of has me thrown, but... Uh, the chicken have... crust was good too. You you uh, you uh put it in the food processor and uh, combine some other stuff in there and it becomes kind of a, a doughy type of substance and then you roll it out and you bake it it's pretty good too i can think of better ways to eat chicken but go ahead <laughs> yeah, like, okay. my bad all right so we make substitutions for the crust okay and that moves us in the direction that we want to go and then we think about the other things that go on the pizza so the pizza sauce we can look mm -hmm. for a pizza sauce that's low in added sugars uh, don't be afraid of the total sugars because tomatoes have sugar in them right and to eating tomatoes is beneficial for you, okay? Uh, so tomato sauce or, or pizza sauce that's low in added sugars. And then our other toppings, our cheese. So you can reduce the amount of cheese. You can actually um, put half the amount of cheese on something and still end up with the taste and the texture yeah. that you like yeah. Yeah. without having all the extra calories and saturated fat. And then we think about some of the toppings that go on there. So you could do mostly veggies. Okay. Yes. And think about adding, um, you know, veggies that have a good protein source. So you can put some beans on top of there. You could do um, some of the plant based meat alternatives, which I am starting to, I, I am thoroughly endor endorsing Beyond Meats. Everything that I've had from Beyond Meat has been fantastic. So I bought those breakfast sausages. Yeah. They are great. They look good in a picture too. Coach Lambie sent me a picture of it and it's like, oh man, this stuff looks great. Yeah, so I had a sausage, egg, and cheese bagel that was completely vegan the other day, and it was fantastic. I, uh, I couldn't tell you that it was not animal products. It was fantastic. But uh, yeah, so the pizza, look at making those substitutions. When you make a sandwich, instead of choosing white bread, choose a whole grain bread. Dave's Killer Bread makes fantastic breads. Um, we've come a long, long ways in the production of whole grain breads. They don't taste like dirt anymore. Oh yeah. Yeah. I like, uh, killer I like killer, I like killer day stuff, but uh, sometimes the, 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 uh, the grocery store 
has it kind of in a corner and people really don't know, see it or they don't know about it. So mm-hmm. uh, it's sometimes is it the freshest that it can be. But if you get a good fresh loaf of Killer Dave's, it's awesome. Love the taste. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so uh, start making those substitutions. Start substituting red meat with other things. You can, of course, use chicken, um, fatty fish. So the more fatty fish you can get in there, the better you're going to be. Uh, start swapping butter with non-hydrogenated margarine. So if you're going to put it on a piece of toast instead of a white bread, choose a whole grain bread. They also make whole grain English muffins and bagels. And instead of putting butter on there, choose a non-hydrogenated margarine. Right. Um, you know, just start making those substitutions. If you're using it as cooking oil, swap the butter with something like grapeseed oil, avocado oil, olive oil. Any of those will be sufficient. Right, right. All right. And that's how you start steering yourself um, into the direction you want to be. So don't try to change your entire diet overnight. Just start substituting the ingredients in your meals to create the same meal, just with better ingredients. Can I interject something right here? It's like, um, so a long time ago, I worked in a pizza place and um, for during college and uh, we would get employee meals. And so I would, I'd make a pizza for my employee meal and man, it's, oh, it's my employee meal. It's, you know, I'm, I'm not paying for it. It's, I mean, I would load it just with stuff and mm-hmm. it was, it just, you know, I had, it was just a mass quantity of, of food. And uh, a friend of mine who I also worked with, he, uh, I saw him make his employee meal one day and he, uh, yeah, it was still, it was still white flour uh, crust. Of course, then we weren't really that concerned about, you know, some of our nutritional things, but what he did was he put just a very minimal amount of sauce. I mean, you know, not just, you could just kind of, you can almost see the, the, the crust Mm -hmm. through there. It was just very minimal. And then he takes cheese, takes mozzarella cheese and he just, Barely sprinkled it on there. He didn't like cover it like we all do. Or we see people do it like uh, pizza places or if you're doing it at home, you cover it with cheese. Mm-hmm. Just a little bit of cheese. And then he uh, uh, he took, uh, we had, uh, we used beef, uh, like uh, ground hamburger, but it was, uh, you know, it was, it was uh, uh, browned in a pan. So it wasn't like big slabs of anything. She just sprinkled just a little bit of that. And then he had, uh, he, he liked uh, onion, so he put just a little bit of onion. I mean, I'm talking about, I could see through to the crust through most of the pizza. I'm like, dude, man, it's your employee meal. You should be stacking that on. He goes, no, no, when you do that, you can't taste the ingredients. Yeah. So, so the next time I tried that, so my, my ingredients were, were lower. I used more veggies and I used less cheese and I used less uh, sauce. And man, it was great. And that's how I, I prefer a pizza. Yeah. It's just minimal, more veggies. Don't pack it down. And it's just so, it's something about just the flavor of what you're eating as opposed to the mass quantity you're shoving in your mouth. Yeah. I don't know. That's my two cents worth. Yep. Good advice. All right. Well, there we go. That's it for this episode. We're keeping it short today. All right. So everybody have a great week. I hope I blew somebody's mind out there. Hope somebody takes something away. Got mine for sure. All right. And we will see you guys next time. Lambie out. See ya.